Capcom has always been one of the biggest pioneers of survival horror. In fact, they very well could be the sole company responsible for popularizing the genre to begin with. With the Resident Evil and Dino Crisis series under their belt, the 90s and early 2000s were a golden age for horror games, pushing numbers far into the millions. Keeping on that horror train, Capcom would assist with Clock Tower 3's development alongside Sunsoft. They would produce a high-budget, goofily theatrical interpretation of the Clock Tower series, and while while I did enjoy it as a weirder and sillier take on Clock Tower, the campy tone, ridiculous plot, and very different gameplay left a lot of fans of the series a little bit disappointed. It was just too different for some people, not just in means of gameplay, but also in tone. But Capcom would later put out something that would scratch that itch for a new, proper Clock Tower game. It wasn't Clock Tower in name, but it certainly was in spirit. That game would be Haunting Ground, one of the final horror games Capcom would put out on the PlayStation 2. It was a brand new, totally original game, not part of any prior series, but despite that, at launch, people couldn't help but to draw all of these comparisons to Clock Tower. It was pretty dang similar. It made too much sense. People didn't care for the new Clock Tower, so Capcom made a spiritual successor that more faithfully captured the essence of the older games, while being a new property so they could take things in a fresh direction. Direction. Others theorized that Haunting Ground was originally going to be Clock Tower 4 and changed direction to make it a new series instead. Some early concept art depicting the main character in more school like outfits, like in Clock Tower 3, could suggest this. But despite all of the speculation, there's never been any official word from Capcom on whether or not Haunting Ground was in fact originally a Clock Tower game or was inspired by the Clock Tower series. But regardless, there's still a good crowd of people that do consider this to be the true Clock Tower. Three. Unfortunately, it didn't really sell well, despite being praised by fans and critics alike, and combine that with how sought after a title it is, and it's not exactly a cheap sell these days. It's not Kuon or a Rule of Rose levels of expensive, but you can still expect to see three digit numbers. It's one of those games I've always wanted to give a proper playthrough, but I've never had the opportunity to because of how difficult it is to get your hands on. Uh, this copy was actually donated to me by a fan. Huge shoutouts, William. I really appreciate that. I sincerely do. Now I can finally experience this thing front to back, see what it's all about, and I guess share my findings as per usual. This game contains scenes of explicit... Wait, I, I wasn't done reading that! That was like the fastest content warning I've ever seen. These are pretty common and come with the territory since some of these games can be rather disturbing, but come on, let me at least read it. I also appreciate the detail on the Capcom logo with the uh, silhouettes running by. That's cool. Alright, so Haunting Ground opens up with a pre-rendered cutscene that sets the scene. Our protagonist is Fiona, a teenage girl who wakes up in a cage while a large ogre-looking guy seems to be making sure she stays put. After being scared away by the thunder, Fiona escapes the cage and makes her way outside, but not before getting spooked by a dog also escaping. She then notices a drop dog collar with the name Huey printed on it. Once we're outside, we now have to make our way to safety. With nothing but a towel wrapped around us, we're left pretty vulnerable and uncomfortable as we fumble our way around this huge weird castle that we've woken up in. So of course, first off, we've got to find some real clothes. After discovering a bedroom of sorts, we run into the castle's maid. I've gathered some clothes for you. Confused and afraid, Fiona keeps her distance, but also tries to get some information out of her as well. Instead, though, she just gets a confusing and foreboding response, alluding to somebody who's in control of the situation. We will keep her here for a while. I will make sure she stays comfortable. Looking at a portrait of this individual triggers a brief memory of the man in question. Completely trapped in this very bizarre situation, Fiona gets changed and begins to explore the castle. So this is where you really start playing. When you're wrapped in that towel, you couldn't really do anything other than walk around and open doors, but once Fiona is in a comfortable set of clothing, you'll then have access to a wider number of moves and gameplay options. Firstly, you can do this little kick with the square button. Uh, this is used to quickly open doors, to break objects like pots, which you can find items in, or for busting through anything that may obstruct your path. <laughs> oh god, I guess that's stronger than it looks. Interestingly, enough, kicking the doors open doesn't always work, and it didn't really click with me at first, but of course, it's because doors usually only open in one direction, so when you're running away from a pursuer, it's a really good idea to remember which ways a door swing. That can be very helpful in optimizing your escape. And that is pretty much what this game is all about, being pursued. Again, it's very easy to draw comparisons to Clock Tower. As you explore the castle, you'll bump into somebody who'll give chase, and to continue exploring and progressing, you'll first have to lose them. This will 
will most often be done by finding a good hiding place and then waiting until they've gone away, and I do really like how the whole system was handled here. Again, it's very similar to Clock Tower 3, but the methods of escape are so much more robust and organic. Firstly, the hiding spots are no longer marked with those big, glowing, video game-ass markers to let you know exactly where you can hide. No, instead you'll have to look around, recognize, and remember what sorts of things you'll be able to hide in, which is much closer to the older games. And what's pretty cool is that you don't actually have to hide in one of those designated hiding zones. Instead, you could just duck in a good spot and the chaser could very well run past you, which will give you a window to backtrack, and you could lose them that way instead. On top of that, you're also equipped with some methods of self-defense, and while they may not outright stop your pursuer, they could potentially aid in slowing them down. Kicking and shoving may knock them back, giving you a brief moment to flee, but the most reliable way of self-defense is easily getting Huey to attack them for you. Remember that dog from earlier? He's an integral part of the game. Throughout your journey through this big winding castle, Huey will accompany Fiona, assisting her with various tasks and in getting away from enemies. There's four commands you can give Huey, each one delivered by pushing one of four directions on the right stick. Up will send him out to attack or to retrieve an out-of-reach item, down will call him and have him follow you, left will scold him, and right will praise him. Now those last two sound fairly interesting, don't they? This game tried to implement this ambitious system where the more you train the dog, the more reliably and consistently he'll listen, so whenever he does an action that's good, like retrieving an item, you'll praise him, and if he doesn't listen to you, you'll scold him. The game recommends trying to do the command twice before scolding. If he doesn't listen after two times, that's when you go over and deal with him. This is a really interesting idea, and I do love the concept of having a bond between the character and her dog being strengthened through gameplay, However, it does get a little bit irritating when you just want the dog to frickin' do something and you have to take all these extra steps before he'll do it. Later into the game, I did find him a lot more responsive, but starting a new game for a second playthrough, you really notice just how much he doesn't listen in the early hours of the game, and I can't imagine a lot of people finding this rather frustrating. In fact, I myself was initially turned off by this feature. I played this game at a friend's house a couple of years ago, I think it was 2013, and while I was enjoying it, I ended up putting it down after a couple of hours because I found the whole dog mechanic to be really frustrating. The game does get pretty good though, so my advice to those that are finding themselves getting a little bit uh, impatient with the dog, try your best to remain patient because he will start to listen as you play on. So with the right stick being used entirely for commanding Huey, that of course means it's not used for the camera controls. So like many horror games of its time, Haunting Ground instead sticks to fixed angles, similar to Resident Evil and some sections in the Silent Hill games. Though the camera's a lot more dynamic here, so it's closer to the camera in Eternal Darkness. You know, there's a lot of pans and rotations. You got the camera glazing over each environment, revealing a lot of cool details in the foreground. Though unlike Eternal Darkness, this game's camera still has those sudden cuts, which is something that can cause problems with control. When you're holding one direction and the camera angle changes, that direction you're holding suddenly means something different. And as per usual, this is mostly solved by having your character continuing to run in the prior direction despite the new angle, which gives you a moment to move the stick to a fresh direction without the character walking the wrong way. Rule of Rose didn't do that, and some of those angles were a nightmare, oh my god, that drove me nuts, but uh, while this is a solution, I still do find it a little bit annoying having to jitter my character's direction every time the camera angle changes, but, you know, the only way to solve this problem outright is by either having tank controls, which nobody really wants, or by omitting the cuts in favor of gradual transitions like Eternal Darkness had. But, um, that's the thing here, that's not really possible, because while the transition to all new areas in Eternal Darkness had a loading screen, which, you know, gave you a moment to reset your bearings each time, Haunting Ground has no loading screens. None whatsoever. Zero. Every single area seamlessly enters the next. There is not a loading screen in this entire game, and I don't know how they pulled this off. The only time you'll ever go through loading is when you're loading your save file. That is it. It is so impressive, but I guess you can leave it to Capcom to optimize the ever-living crap out of their games. Man, it's gonna be a little bit difficult going back to Silent Hill after this and sitting through a loading screen after entering every single room, though I guess that does have its appeal. You know, you get a moment to wait and wonder what horrors are gonna meet you on the other side when the screen fades back in. I remember I would always hold down the right trigger to ready my weapon as I waited. God, that's like unnerving. <laughs> 
But I guess that sort of thing really does lend itself better to Silent Hill than it does a game fashion after Clock Tower, because the only real enemies you encounter here are the chasers, and the lack of loading screens means your escape is relentless. No time to breathe, just run like hell until you get away. The lack of loading screens sort of elevates that sensation, so I do think it was a really good choice to make that work here. One more thing this game does a little bit similar to Clock Tower 3 is the panic system, though it does work much differently here. Instead of just being near a chaser, bringing up your panic, causing you to nonsensically flee cover like an idiot, panic is instead caused by being chased or by being damaged by chasers and by smaller enemies. Well, they're not really enemies because you don't fight them. I guess you can kick over these guys, which is pretty funny. I know I just said there's like no enemies other than the chasers, but there are these things. Um, these things won't cause you damage, but they will increase your panic. And if Fiona is panicked enough to scream, a chaser might hear you and then they'll show up and that's no good. Earlier in the game, these are these firefly-like creatures called luminescence. They're slow and rather easy to avoid, but you can't fight them and you can't get rid of them, so you will have to make sure to close doors behind them so they don't sneak up on you. Later on, you'll start to encounter these little ankle-biting mutant things. Again, they don't damage you, but having them make contact with Fiona will freak her out. Help! Or you can just knock them over. <laughs> Now, panic isn't something you just want to avoid so you don't attract the chaser. It also hinders your ability to escape. If it gets too high, Fiona will have a harder time keeping her balance. She might stumble and fall down, and while in that animation, you'll briefly lose control of the direction you're running in. This is also combined with this visual impairment. The more panicked you are, the less color will be on screen, and the higher the contrast. This serves as not just an interesting visual way to communicate how panicked you are, but it also makes it harder to see where you're freaking going. Each room filled with objects becomes an illegible mess of abstract shapes that's very difficult to navigate, so you'll be more likely to bump into things, giving the chaser more time to catch up. In this game, panic is all about hindering your ability to escape, not taking it away outright. It doesn't get rid of the cover, it just makes it harder to get to it, and personally, I think that's a much better way to go about it. Another thing I like about this game a lot is how there's no HUD elements. In Clock Tower 3, there's like this big goofy meter to show you exactly how panicked you were, but here it's instead communicated by how the screen overall is reacting. Milder panic will have this heart-throbbing effect that's as visible on screen as it is in your controller, you will physically feel Fiona's heart thumping. I like this a lot better. I mean, it's pretty easy and video gamey to just throw a meter on screen to tell you how much you have, but using more dramatic visual cues are not only a more interesting and anxiety-inducing way to communicate this, but it also serves the purpose of visually impairing you again. There's items you can find in the game to recover your stamina. You'll pretty much find these as a reward for exploring around. Your panic and stamina will go back to normal by itself over time, but when you're in a pinch, these are really good for bringing it back to normal so you can have an easier time getting away. There's also items you can use to significantly slow down whoever's chasing you. These tiny little explosives you'll either throw or place on the ground. These are created through alchemy in these labs you'll find in these Silent Hill 4 looking holes in the wall. Using these machines, you'll transmute these medallions you'll find into useful items through this minigame thing. You pretty much just have to time your button presses to get as many circles of the same color as possible, but the timing is really precise, so it's pretty hard to do deliberately. Personally, I found a lot more luck in just mashing through them, or by closing my eyes and hitting the button at random because my reflexes were just not fast enough to do this. Alchemy is something that's very involved throughout the game's story, which has a much more consistently grim tone this time. That was a big thing people really didn't care for in Clock Tower 3, was how melodramatic and campy it was. Hunting Grounds performances, they're much more nuanced. You're not gonna have people acting like freaking Metal Gear Solid villains. Dinner is served, miss. The characters here come off as genuinely intimidating and threatening. It's not like Clock Tower 3 where they're a super villain from hell who murdered hundreds of people and now they're gonna murder you too! That's all, folks! Here the situations aren't so ludicrous. They feel like they could actually somewhat happen in real life because the characters' motives actually make sense. They're complicated, they're detailed, they're understandable. They're motives that aren't just, I'm a killer, so I'm going to kill you. 
This consistently spans across the game's multiple chasers. Every chapter has a different person chasing you, which ends with a boss fight against said person. The first one being that big ogre guy. Um, apologies if I'm not saying this correctly, but uh, his name is Debilitus, and while he's this large hulking creature of a person, he has the mind of an infant. Right off the bat, you see him playing with a doll, and to him, Fiona is indistinguishable from a plaything. He sees her as a doll too. It's sort of like a twisted take on the gentle giant trope. He means no harm, he has no malicious intent, but the actions he performs to achieve those intentions are going to probably kill somebody. Onward to the next chaser, it's that maid from before, her name is Daniela. Uh, she claims to be a perfect woman, but she's absent of many of the qualities that make somebody truly human pleasure, emotion, being able to taste what you eat, it's difficult to determine, but her motives for wanting to kill Fiona are likely derived from either disgust or jealousy that Fiona has those human qualities that she lacks. Now, what's sort of interesting is that every stalker will behave in different ways, each one doing something that makes them a little bit harder to escape than the last. Daniela, for instance, while Delbilitis would charge into the room and start looking around, she will carefully close the door behind her. That means you can no longer hide behind the door as it opens and that also means you've got to deal with an extra obstacle in your way when you're getting out of there. The third stalker is where things really get dangerous. It's a cloaked man named Ricardo, and he behaves pretty similarly to Daniela, but he kind of has a gun, which makes him really dangerous if he gets close to you. If you land on the ground in front of him, he's gonna bust a cap in your head. There are two more stalkers, but that's getting a little close to the end of the game, so I'm gonna save talking about those two for later when I do the spoiler section. Now, while I do really love what they did with the chasing gameplay, there were still times I would get really annoyed with it. Sometimes I just wanted to get a puzzle done, but first I'd have to run around in circles trying to get away, and if you get unlucky enough to run into them multiple times within a short time frame, it can get really exhausting. That's pretty much what you're doing when you're not running away, exploring the castle, finding key items, and solving puzzles to make your way to the end of a chapter, discovering why you're here in the process. Some puzzles will involve utilizing Huey in some sort of way. Sometimes it's as simple as clicking up in the sticks so he shows you the path to take, and other times you'll have to get him to sit on a button to keep something activated. Other puzzles will have you interpreting codes from messages and then inputting them into some sort of device. Like here, you've got to stamp a word onto this plate and then insert that plate inside this golem, which gets him to walk out of the way. Oh, there's actually a really great easter egg here. If you type in Salatio onto the plate instead, it does a freaking dance for you, that's so great! Or you can type in meth instead of emyth and it'll crumble in the dust. Oh, um, while I'm talking about that plate printer thing, uh, there's a really clever line here that gives you a pretty good idea of what time period the game takes place in, because I really wasn't sure at first. You're in a big old timey castle with like medieval looking clothing, yet there's cars and there's also electricity, so I was like, wait, is this modern day? Is it the 50s? Is it what? Um, but yeah, interacting with the plate printer for the first time mentions that it sort of looks like a computer, so I was like, oh, a computer, so, so it is modern day, cool. I thought having that line was a really good idea. This puzzle here has you inputting a code in the Matoran language from Bionicle. Okay, I know that's not what it's supposed to be, but you have to admit, it looks exactly like it. In fact, it is it, really. Like, look at it. Okay, this one, this character is not a character there, but... Man, I still can read this. I learned how to when I was a kid. I know that's lame as hell, but... How do I manage to bring up Bionicle in a horror game video? What am I doing? Overall, I'd say the puzzles are alright, but the game really hits it out of the park when it comes to the atmosphere. The music here is freaking terrifying. I imagine it's definitely gonna keep many people on edge as they search the castle. There's a lot of detail here. Every single room is thoroughly decorated and stands out as something unique. Not two rooms really look that much alike, not even the hallways. Every room is so distinct from one another, and because of that, the castle is actually pretty easy to navigate. In fact, so much so that I never had to look at the map. If I ever needed to go back to some place, I'd usually be able to get there fairly quickly on my own. Not to mention, as you play, you'll unlock a lot of shortcuts around the castle, so it never takes too long to get back to some place, and there's often multiple pathways back to any given area. If I had to compare the level design to something a lot of people will be familiar with, I'd say it's fairly close to Resident Evil 1, you know, like how it all takes place on a single property and you uncover more and more of the building in question as you play. Each chapter does take place in an isolated area though. The chunk of the castle chapter 1 takes place in will be inaccessible in chapter 2, which I don't think is a bad thing, uh, since you won't be overwhelmed with too much ground to cover when trying to figure out where to go and what to do. Oh god, speaking of chapter 2, these dogs 
stalls really started to freak me out. Like every time the camera would cut right here, I would always think there was a person standing there for a second. I think that's probably why mannequins and dolls are so popular in horror games, because it creates those moments of, oh crap, I thought somebody was there. Personally though, I don't think anything ever gets me worse than the freaking coat rack in PT. God, I don't know why, but every time I walk past that thing, I have to do a double take. That concept has put the very effective use right here, but other than this, I didn't really find the game terribly scary. The atmosphere is really creepy, and that's great, but I don't know, the chasers didn't really do much for me. I'm trying to get away from them, but I didn't necessarily feel scared in the process. I mean, again, I sometimes even found this annoying. I'm sure they expect me to react like this. Oh no! Leave me alone, leave me alone, leave me alone! Leave me alone! No, leave me alone! But the way I actually react was a lot closer to this. Oh no, leave me alone. Leave me alone! Please, leave me alone. Honestly, I found this game a lot more disturbing than I did find it scary. There's a number of plot points that are pretty screwed up, so uh... Yeah, I guess this is a pretty good spot for that spoiler warning. The plot's not terribly complicated, but it is pretty grim, so... Yeah, I guess consider this also a warning if you don't like hearing about sensitive or gruesome material as well. Alright, so it turns out that the owner of the castle is a man named Lorenzo. Basically, he's used alchemy to clone himself again and again over the course of hundreds of years, in attempt to achieve a sort of immortality. This is why Ricardo looks so much like Fiona's father, because they are both clones of this individual. We are clones. Yep, Fiona's father is a clone. He ended up running away to live a normal life, betraying Lorenzo and his plans. He got married and had a daughter, Fiona. This makes Fiona weirdly related to Lorenzo. Kinda, she's like his weird clone niece or something? I don't know. Being the daughter of the clone Lorenzo specifically, like, engineered or something for his plan, Fiona now carries within her what's called the Azoth. I'm not entirely sure what that is. I found this a little bit confusing, but it's something to do with alchemy and creating life. So, essentially, Lorenzo wants Fiona to be a sort of surrogate mother for the next generation of cloning. You can't grow a human being in a test tube. Not even a clone. You need a woman's body to give it life. So, Lorenzo wants to, like, pseudo-rape her, but, like, not actually, he just wants to, like, impregnate her using alchemy and force her to give birth to his clones, which is even more screwed up because she's technically giving birth to her father because her father was also a clone of... It, it is so fucked up, man. You know, I'm a little bit surprised I didn't warn about this during that screen. I don't know, personally I find themes of incest and rape to be a lot more disturbing than, you know, just violence and gore because, I don't know, video game violence is so exaggerated and discernibly fictional, but the other things feel more grounded in reality, I guess? I, I, they could at least resonate in a much more real manner, perhaps. I don't, I don't really know why for sure I find one more disturbing than the other, but I do think it's probably worth being paired with the other on a screen like this. When you first meet Lorenzo, he's this sickly old man confined to a wheelchair, and he'll still come after you though, crawling on the ground like a zombie. It's really unsettling and freaky. Later on, he somehow restores his youth, I, I think using the Azoth? That's what he says, I don't really know what's going on, I found this part really confusing. But regardless, once he's younger, he's much harder to deal with. He can use all of these crazy alchemy powers like shockwaves and teleporting. And even when you knock the dude into a frickin' pit of lava, he still doesn't give up. His burning corpse makes a last-ditch effort to stop Fiona from getting away. Jesus Christ, now that is some determination. So anyway, in the end, you defeat Lorenzo, put an end to the cloning, and escape safely. Again, the plot's not terribly complicated. It's not like a big allegory one must interpret to understand what's happening to the lead character, but there is some interesting lore here, and some pretty great themes. Firstly, the whole thing of alchemy and cloning. It explains what Daniela really is. She's a homunculus, an artificial human, which explains her jealousy or disgust of Fiona being a real human. Well, at least like half a real human, because her father was a homunculus or clone or whatever, so... I don't know, I guess that's enough human to make this woman angry about it, I don't know. There's a lot here that hammers in this idea of Fiona being in a position of powerlessness, despite her kind of being integral to achieving the villain's plan. Even down to the cinematography. Oh, this one shot right here of the lock gates towering over here as the focal length changes to make it look like it's rising, her only escape being completely inaccessible, putting her in a position where she's completely stripped of control over her situation. Cinematography has a language, and this shot 
shot screams. Which is why I absolutely hate that they fade out on it before you can even stop to appreciate it. For real, it's on screen for one second. Come on, guys. You almost had a really powerful shot. A little bit off topic, but this is one of the reasons I really hate it when people claim that film influence does not belong in video games. And like, I get not liking fake film grain. I get not liking fake aspect ratios. That's fine. But things like the positioning of a camera and the use of different focal lengths to frame and position the characters, it conveys things that can contribute to the themes of a story. When the big scary guy is filling the frame and Fiona looks tiny by comparison, that's an assertion of dominance by the scene's director, and it effectively makes you feel a certain way that you would not if you had to view the scene with a boring default video game camera. Assassin's Creed 1 did this, and it was like the dumbest shit ever. Like, I don't care if people find this more immersive, I find it less engaging. It doesn't say anything. But anyway, back to the themes of the game or whatever, apologies for my stupid film student rant, uh, Fiona is basically the most important thing in making this plan work, so doesn't that mean she should have all the power? Doesn't that mean that she should be in control over whether or not this plan works? Well, yeah, she kinda does, which is why Lorenzo puts her in all of these situations to make her feel like she doesn't have any power. And during the game's ending, we see a role reversal. Debilitas, somebody that Fiona once feared, now respects her as his superior. In a way, this sort of represents how she's overcome this powerlessness and starts to fulfill her rightful role, somebody who is in control of the situation. Also in a literal sense too, because she's technically the heir to the castle since she was part of the family and she kind of killed everybody else that owns it, so she just inherited this big castle because she murdered everybody else. But you know, in, in a personal sense too, in like a metaphorical sense as well, because she's overcoming these obstacles that made her feel that way to begin with. And that is Haunting Ground. I thought that was pretty good. Uh, definitely better than Clock Tower 3 was, that's for sure, despite being so similar. I think this game just kind of takes everything that game tried to do and does it a lot better. I still do enjoy both games in one way or another, but if I had to recommend just one, it's gonna be this one. I can imagine that most people will like the story in this game a lot more, and the whole panic and chasing system is handled so much better. And like any good horror game from this time period, there's some awesome bonuses too. If you beat the game early on a second playthrough, you unlock a frickin' frog suit. It is... It is ridiculously stupid, and I love it. Hold on, Froggy! I'm coming! You unlock this by finding Debilitas after beating the boss fight with him, and then he gives you a key to a hidden room. Down there, you'll find the key to the front gate so you can make an early escape. Uh, but again, that's only there on a second playthrough normally. It's just like a kick upgrade. There's also some other stuff too, like a cowgirl outfit and this like Diminitrix outfit. And like, I guess sexy costumes have their appeal, but I've always much preferred the really goofy stuff. It's just a lot more fun to me. And well, I don't know about you, but that's why I'm playing video games to have fun, not the jack off my dick. Though the cowgirl outfit does kind of give you a gun, and it's super good for dealing with chasers. It's really short ranged and really difficult to line up the shot properly, but if you do land those shots, these guys don't stand a chance. But man, real talk here, I really miss how older horror games had these ridiculously stupid costumes like this. Can we please bring that back? There's nothing better than replaying a game and watching these characters play it just as seriously, dressed like they're going to a damn convention. From now on, if anyone makes fun of me, I'll kill him! Just like that. Eddie, have you gone nuts? Have I gone nuts? Have you gone nuts? I know some recent stuff, like the uh, RE2 remake, did have alternate costumes, but nothing really outrageous or stupid. I guess there's the tofu thing, yeah, but that's a whole separate game mode. You can't use that in the main game, so you don't get to watch the cutscenes with it. I just really love the idea of your reward for getting through this nightmare being something that's so betraying of the horror genre. Oh, you made it through? Okay, uh, here's something to make the game a little less scary sort of thing, I guess. Oh, before I forget, oh my god, uh, when you beat the game on hard mode, you unlock a plush toy costume for Huey. Look at him, he's adorable. This is so stupid, I love it. Oh, I guess also worth a mention is that hard mode is actually pretty interesting. Like aside from obviously being harder, the comments tab is totally different. Normally throughout the game after each story beat, this would be updated with a Fiona's thoughts on the current situation, but on hard mode, it's all from Huey's perspective. That's so cool. You also unlock this mini game where you can play as Huey and you have to guide Fiona, which is a cool idea, I guess, but I don't know, I just found it really frustrating. It's just an annoying escort mission. I don't know why I would want to play this. 
But, uh, yeah, I guess that just about covers everything. I think so, at least. Uh, yeah, I definitely recommend playing this game, but of course, the problem there is, it's really hard to find. And even still, when you find it, it's gonna be pretty expensive. I guess you could cheap out and buy a PAL region copy, because those are a little less expensive. But even still, Capcom really needs to get their act together and re-release this thing on a digital storefront, so it's easier to get your hands on. It's already on the Japanese PlayStation Network. What are you guys doing? Come on, bring it to the rest of the world. Accessibility is is very important. You've already ported Resident Evil 4 to every platform imaginable, how hard could it be to do the same for Haunting Ground? You guys gotta get on that because people need to be able to play this thing without paying 200 bucks.